Good morning, everybody. Yeah. Morning. We're going to praise the Lord, right? This praise is the day the Lord, Lord has made, yes. and we will. We choose yes. to rejoice and be glad in it. Yes. And the scripture also says that His mercies are new every morning. Yes. We don't get leftovers. <laughs> <laughs> we don't get the drinks of what was, you know, at the bottom of the barrel. His new mercies are new every morning. And so this is a new morning and a new day. Lord, we thank you that you have brought us a new day. You have brought us to the beginning of a new day so that we can praise you and we can worship you and we can lift up your holy name. For you have said that wherever your name is lifted up, you will draw everyone to you. And so we want to be drawn to you. We're going to lift up your holy name right now and uh, give you all the praise. All right, so this is the last uh, workshop on a four. So I'm going to give, since not everybody was here at all four, I'm going to give you a really quick review to see so that you can get an idea of where we, where we come from and where we're going. So this is the culmination. To me, this is the most practical and the most fun of them all. So we started with the plan. God had a plan for mankind. God had a plan that we would worship Him. He created us to worship Him. He created us to be in His presence. He created us for Himself, for His great pleasure. He wants to bless us. That's why He went through all that trouble and gave us the gift of free will. Now His plan was that we would worship Him and be one with Him. That's the big plan. And that we should have been able to go from here, always staying in His presence and being here. However, sin got in the way. Adam blew it. If Adam didn't sin, we might have been able to go straight across. But Adam blew it. So sin got in the way. So God had to do something to restore us to get there. So from sin, then, he gave us his word. So that we, he wrote it down, had it written down, had Moses write it, had the prophets write it so that there could be no misinterpretation. Because you know how it is when things go word of mouth and gets twisted a little bit. So he gave us his word. And from his word, we still didn't get it. So he has to do, he needed to do something to remove sin. This one told us how not to sin and told us what to do to avoid sin. But it didn't remove sin, so he sent Jesus. And the blood of Jesus is what removes sin. So that's really important for you to, to get as a Christian because the sin exists. Whether or not you want to admit it, it's going to exist. And you have a choice of either covering it up, burying it, flaunting it or remove it. And removing it is really the best solution to get where you want to get. So Jesus came to remove sin. Jesus is in line with God. So what happened here is if you chose and you stepped outside of being in alignment with God, he gave you the opportunity to do something. Remember what that is? You step outside, then you need to repent. If somebody pushed you off and you ended up outside here because somebody else did it to you, then you need to forgive. Make sure you've got that one right now. If you stepped outside, 
then you need to what? Nice and loud. <laughs> Repent. And if somebody pushed you off, you need to So can you say you need to we need to have this in vocabulary. I forgive you. Say it. I forgive you. Okay, that's the right biblical vocabulary. Because we hear in the world, ah, no big deal. There's nothing to apologize for. Um, that's okay. Don't worry about it. That's, that's not biblical. So you need to get that in your vocabulary, is I forgive you. Or, I, you know, it's forgiven. This is the big word. Now repent. is going to the Lord and saying, I repent. That means I, I have chosen to make a change. I did that. I repent. I'm choosing to make a change. I'm going over this again because this is one of those things that gets mixed up. If I say to Becca, please forgive me for throwing rocks at you, I'm asking her to do something. I haven't done a thing that I can keep throwing rocks at her. Because I haven't repented. So I need to say, I repent of throwing rocks at her. And therefore that means I have chosen now to put my rocks down. I'm not going to throw rocks at her anymore. Do you see the difference? Because people say, have said to me, I keep asking the Lord to forgive me for having my bad attitude against my neighbor. I ask the Lord to forgive me for... Um, for gossiping about my co-workers. That's not, so you're asking God to do something. You need to say, I repent of gossiping about my co-workers. I repent of holding grudges in my heart for my, against my neighbor. That's what you have to do. As long as you don't have to do it, it stands. Is that clear? Let's hear you say, I repent. I repent. All right? And I forget. I forgive. Okay, two really important words in your vocabulary. So then, after you get those two down, then I took you through honor father and mother. That's really important. Because the Bible says, honor your father and mother so that your days may be long and all will go well with you. So you're not doing that to say that they're perfect. You're not doing that to make them perfect. You're not do you're doing that for yourself. Honor your father and your mother. And the way you honor your father and mother is you forgive them for in any way that they have offended you. Whether they meant it or not doesn't matter. If you felt offended, then you were offended. And then you need to repent of the things that you did against them. Your attitudes, your actions, your thoughts. Okay, so we need to repent. And we went through that on the first, the first workshop to honor father and mother. So I'll tell you a story, a praise report. I was praying with a young lady who said, I just don't like to be around people in these family gatherings with her in-laws. She says, I can't stand there. I can't be there for more than 45 minutes. So, I asked her, I says, well, what was it like for you growing up? And it turned out it was a rather difficult childhood. So I walked her through this whole thing, just like I did with you on the first workshop. Honor your father and mother by forgiving and repenting, and we went back and forth, back and forth, and did that. And then a month later, when I met with her again, she said, I am so surprised because we went to a family gathering with my, at my in-laws' home, and normally up to now, after about 45 minutes, I would give my husband the look, you know, the look, meaning we've got to get out of here, take us, take us home, take me home. But she said, I was comfortable, and we stayed, and he... After an hour, he kept asking me, are you all right? And she says, yeah, I'm fine. And then, are you all right? She said, we were the last to leave. 
we were the last to leave. She said, I really enjoyed being with them. I didn't have that heaviness. I didn't have that nervous, I gotta get out of here. And so, you see, what happens? Although you say, oh no, you know, my parents are fine, we're good. Maybe, maybe not. <clears throat> so I always say, do it. Why? It's for your good. Repent and forgive and honor your father and your mother. So that's key, because everything comes down from the top, right? God is our Father, so in order to, if you want to honor Him, it's very difficult not to honor your earthly father, no matter how good or how bad, how far, whether you're alive or dead. Honoring your earthly father and mother is going to allow you to honor God. It just opens it up, and then allows you to honor anybody else who kind of fits in that category. Any elders. All right, so that was number one. So the next one was sanctification. How many of you wash dishes after you use them? For the next meal, right? right. You wash the dishes. Now, if you weren't taught how to wash dishes, if you didn't know you had to wash the inside and the outside of the glass, and you only wash the outside, <coughs> then the inside would always, would always be dirty or would always have the leftover from whatever the last drink was. All right, so this is what we get in sanctification, is to clean up, to clean up things. So, and then, so I, I taught you about the body, the soul, and the spirit. And what are the things to look for that you need to, um, to clean up? That's really important. Now, if you don't go through this process, this is a, a one-time process. If you don't know how to do this, and you go, don't go through this process, then there are going to be some roadblocks in where you want to get to. You have some deficits, some things you can't do because something's in the way. For instance, so everybody drives a car? Everybody has a car? If your windshield wipers don't work, what does that mean? What's that? That means you have to change it. But what does that mean? If windshield wipers don't work, you cannot drive in the rain. If headlights don't work, what does that mean? You cannot drive in the dark or at night. You see how that works? If you have no gas in your car, you are, it's not going to take you anywhere. You can push it in your, on your car in order for you to have the full advantage. So you have to have gas in it, all the windshield wipers and the lights and the whatever else gadgets that you have that are necessary for the car to drive. You have to change the oil, right? Yeah. I remember the first my first car, I had no clue that you have to change the oil after a certain amount of time or miles or something like that. And the uh, red light's flashing, and mm, what is this? All I knew is you put gas in it, drive it till the tank's empty, put gas in it and drive it till the tank's empty. Until somebody taught me, no, you have to change the oil. You have to check the fluids, at least old cars did. You have to check the fluids, you have to check this, you have to change the windshield wipers, you gotta change the, the, the light bulbs and the tail lights. All these maintenance things so that you can get full use of your car. This is the same thing here. So that's what I was I was teaching you. You need to know, you know, which ones are the tail lights and <laughs> which ones are the windshield wipers. So then you can take care of it and you can have full use of your life. So that's what that one was all about. Now, the next thing was righteousness. So after you go through this, so now you understand repent and forgive, and you go through repent and forgive and clean up all these parts of your life. Now righteousness is, how do I stay there? You want to stay there. You don't want to have to always just 
you know, all that same old thing, go back, same old, you're going to feel like a ping pong ball being tossed back and forth the table. So righteousness were the things that I was teaching you about staying in righteousness. So one of the things I taught you was donut living. How to, um, about strongholds. How to break strongholds. You see, we have to, we have to live smart. We have inner judgment, inner vows and judgments. That's, that's when you make judgments against yourself. When you make judgments against other people. How to get out of those and how to stay out of those. So for instance, you have to you have to know that the enemy has traps for you. The enemy knows your weaknesses. You're not hiding anything. But God knows your weaknesses. The enemy will try to take advantage of your weaknesses. God will help you strengthen so that you're not weak anymore and he will be there to protect you. He will be there to help you. So, your question is, God is for you, Satan is against you, who are you going to vote for? <laughs> Three votes, right? <laughs> so, if you're going to vote for yourself, then you have to, you have to choose God, because he's for you. <clears throat> so, the test of your inner vows and judgments these two form a world. Now the way you can tell whether how much of inner vows and judgments you have is how easily are you offended. Let me say that again. How easily are you offended? <clears throat> Remember I told you about giving invitations to Satan to run around in your life? passed out all little coupons that whenever you sin you're passing out these little coupons tickets for Satan to come running around in your life if you pass out enough of those it's going to be used against you and the reason, the way you can tell whether you have a lot of those out there is you are offended easily people could say things that was just kind of a general remark, but you take, take offense at it. And so you have to say, if that keeps happening, you need to say, hmm, something's going on in me. Because the, the temptation is to say, well, that person is always so negative. Maybe they weren't being negative, but you heard it negative. So you need to watch out the inner vows and the judgments. I always say inner vows and judgments work like Velcro. You know, if you had a Velcro suit on, every time you rub past something, somebody, you, it sticks, and you get the fuzz from whatever, you know, uh, sweaters, hair, anything sticks to you. And you, you're saying, you know, hey, why are the people putting all this stuff on me? Well, no, they're not putting it on you. You're the one who's taking it. You're the one who's attracting it. So you want to, by repent and forgive, you want to get rid of these things so that you're slick. Things don't stick to you. You want to be slippery. So even if they did make a comment about you, even if they did say something derogatory about you, it just goes creep off. You're not going to take offense. Because you taking offense is exactly what Satan wants you to do. Because you get angry, you'll be resentful, you'll be doing things against other people, you'll be, or you'll isolate yourself. Those people are always so, they're always so um, negative. I don't want to be around them anymore. And so you isolate yourself. And when you isolate yourself, you have no fellowship. And if you have no fellowship with one another, you're not going to be able to have fellowship with God. See, he's sneaky. So you need to be 
speaking. You need to be wise. The Bible tells us, he says, you must be as shrewd as serpents, but innocent as doves. That one, you we got to understand. Shrewd, shrewd means that you're wise, you're sharp, you're practical, and you can see what is going on, what's really going on. If you're not shrewd, it's always, oh, they're mean to me. How come I always get to do this? I always get the bad stand on the stick. And then you just, you know, your Velcro is <laughs> growing. <laughs> and you always, then you, then, you, then you have a little pity party, and a little pity party grows into a big pity party, and then you're a mess. All right, so, and as innocent as dolls. Innocent. Innocent means you have no guilt. A moral, uh, a moral attitude or sin. You're not doing wrong stuff. And so the two are important because there are too many times we only get the innocent of God. Well, I didn't do anything wrong. Well, maybe you didn't do anything wrong, but you're not shrewd enough to stay out of that situation. You need to be shrewd enough to avoid this, or you need to be shrewd enough to make sure you're planning ahead. All right, so the two things go together. You need to be shrewd and you need to be innocent. And that's what's going to bring you and keep you in righteousness. So now, transformation. You have a little packet. Look in the cover that I gave you. You see that symbol there? The picture? The transformation. What we are meant to be are prophets, kings, and priests. The crown, of course, obviously is a king. The orb is a priest. And the scepter is a prophet. Because prophets speak on behalf of God. Prophets represent God. And that's the, the scepter of authority. And we are given those. The problem is, we need to learn how to use them. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to learn how to use them. Because your staff scepter is your sign of authority, but you're not supposed to use it to whip everybody around and crack them on the head and, you know, do that kind of stuff. So we need to know how to use that. The crown is uh, for the king. We need to know how to be kings. Kings govern. All right? They're not supposed to be despots. They're not supposed to um, be dictators, but kings govern. So we need to know what our responsibilities are to govern. And the last one is the priest. And what does a priest do, and how do you be a priest? And so when we get there, I'm going to clear up some misconceptions of the priest as, um, as, as in this case. I don't mean a priest necessarily somebody who is ordained in the church and they be the pastor and they, well, that's not what I mean. Because we are all called to be of the royal priesthood. So that must mean all of us, which means there must be something. There must be something here. So we're going to talk about that. All right, so <clears throat> let's. Obedience. Obedience is the key. Obedience is the key to be transformed into a prophet, king, and priest. Oh, we don't like that word obedience because we want to do things our way. And that's how the devil can get an inroad because obedience is not something that we, you know, say, oh yeah, I want to be obedient. Right, so let me give you an idea. There are, there are three mindsets. So you can take notes if you want here, because I didn't put it all in there. There are three mindsets. There's a barbarian mindset, there is the Greek mindset, and there is a Hebrew mindset. The barbarian mindset is might is right. So, Today's time, ISIS is a barbarian mindset. You do it the way I say, or off with your head. 
whatever I say, the beliefs I have, the way I want to do things, is my way. And no, there is no other way. Now, that's the, that's the extreme, but I put that out there so that you get the idea. But bullying is a barbarian, barbarian mindset that I'm going to push you, I'm going to criticize you, I'm going to um, kick you and, and all that to, to show you that I am right. Might is right. That's the barbarian thinking. The next thinking is the Greek thinking. The Greeks say, I have to understand. Do you remember Paul was in, in Athens and he went to the, uh, the forum there where they were speaking, and they all said, you know, well, tell us some more, tell us some more. And they all listened and understood and tried to understand, but people were not accepting Christ as their Savior because they were just trying to understand. And the Greek mindset says, I, um, I have to understand it before I can accept it. I have to understand it before I, can, before I will do it. I want to know why about everything. Now that's the extreme. I mean, we shouldn't be stupid or ignorant, but at the same time, to, to wait till you understand. I don't understand why God does this. I don't understand why I should go to church. Okay, if you wait until you understand, you may never get there. So, that's the Greek. You get stuck up here. The Hebrew mindset is you obey, and after you obey, you will understand. So let me give you an example. If this room is dark, and I say to Debbie, go over there and take that light switch and push it up. If she's a Greek, she would say, but why? I don't understand why you want me to do that. And even if I explain to her, electricity is coming through, and you know, then it goes through that light switch, and it turns it on, and maybe we're, it's going to take forever. And even then she says, but I don't understand. But if she has a Hebrew mindset, and I say, Debbie, see that lever, push it up. She get up, push the lever, Lights go on until the, oh, it turns the lights on. Then she understood. She didn't have to know about all the electrical lines and all those kinds of things because just by plain obedience, the understanding came. That turns on lights. Do you see the difference? Okay, so God tells us certain things and he says, obey, just do it. And once you do it, then you'll, then you'll understand. The Greeks go the other way. I have to understand. I have to know why before I do it. And so then we're stuck. So these three mindsets are very important for you to see because there you're going to come up to things in your life where God's going to say, do it. Are you going to get stuck saying, why? Or are you going to get stuck on the other side with, with the bullying says, well, I don't want to do it. That's not, get, get them to do it. Send, you know, send that person. I don't want to do it. And so being transformed, we need to understand, we need to know that obedience is a key. Right? Obedience is a key. So on the, someplace on your notes, anywhere you want to write it, number one to ten. I'm going to read you some situations and I want you to write yes, no, or sometimes. This is going to be our obedience score. So, but number one, now just be honest. Do you park in no parking zones, such as handicapped fire lanes and loading zones, and make excuses why it's okay for you and not others? You write either yes, no, or sometimes. Just number one to ten. That was number one. 
Number two, do you make, your, make up your own directions rather than follow those that are given or printed? Number three, do you ignore company policy if you don't agree with it? Would you say that again? Do you ignore company policy if you don't agree with it? Four, do you take medications when you feel like it and not as directed? <laughs> <laughs> Five, do you spend time criticizing procedures such as at the bank, the insurance company, job applications, and the DMV? Six, do you usually arrive late to work, a party, or meetings, or church? Seven, do you frequently forget what you are supposed to bring? Eight, do you fail to carry through on responsibilities such as pay the bills, file the taxes, hand in reports, and meet deadlines? Nine, do you make promises, then forget them? Ten, do you ignore stop signs, pedestrian right of way, and other road rules? They go to California stop, right? <laughs> so count up how many yeses and how many noes and how many sometimes you have. So if you have mostly or all no, you have a high obedience score. If you have many sometime answers, you are wishy-washy. <laughs> if you answer yes to all of the above, you are walking in disobedience. <laughs> So you see, God gives us things in the natural to practice our obedience. Because when the real thing comes, when we need to be absolutely obedient to Him, we need to, we need to have been practiced up. So those are examples of obedience in the natural, and those are your opportunities to practice. So if you are being transformed into His likeness, then we must ourselves be different and not behave like the world's pattern. And why do you want to be transformed? So that you can possess and become change agents in the promised land. Well, what's the promised land? So that in the promised land, we can show his glory and he can bless us. That's why you want to be in the promised land. You want to receive the blessings. So let's Sorry. see, make sure you got, the, got that right. Is all that in our notes? No. Okay. It's in my book. Okay. Okay. It's in the book. Okay. It's in the book. Mm -hmm. All right, so here you, here you go. You got obedience so that you can walk in the promised land so that you can get all the blessings. If you are in disobedience, you're not going to be in the promised promise land and you're going to miss the blessings. So you really want to be in the promised land in obedience as much as possible. And he makes it possible right here. That's why that first session was so important. Because if you were in disobedience and you stepped out of that line, 
then you can. Come on, what do you do to get back in line? Repent. Repent. Somebody kicked you out of there, you can forgive. forgive. So you can get into the promised land. He says, I gave you land on which you did not toil, cities you did not build, and you live in them and eat the vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. So how can you tell when you're in your promised land? Os Hillman writes, I'm going to read this quote. He says, I began to experience this new way of living as I began to be obedient to doing things based on his direction versus my own perceived outcome. Provision began to, be, to follow obedience. Projects began to get done with little sweat. God brought the people to me to get things done. There was no longer a tendency to manipulate outcomes that I wanted to have happen. God was giving me my promised land as I yielded to him. So obedience is a big factor in getting to the promised land. Now, I'm going to caution you. One of the things that you need to know is that results does not dictate obedience. Results do not dictate the level of your obedience. Let me give you an example. This was my personal experience. So I had a friend who had cancer. And I prayed, others prayed too, but I prayed and I ministered to her. And she recovered. Yay, God. She recovered and was, was fine for about three years. Then at the end of three years, the cancer came back with a vengeance. And so I went and I ministered to her and I prayed. The Lord told me to pray for her. I prayed with her, visited in the hospital, took communion, did all these things stuck with it for about six months, and then she died. And I said, Lord, what's up with this? You know, we all prayed, and I prayed, I did all this, 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 this. And she died. How come? And the Lord said to me, did you do everything I asked you to do? And I said, yes. And he said, that's all that matters. That's all that matters. My issue is, was I obedient? Whether she lived or died was not my issue. That was his issue. So, you know, that taught me the result that I want is not necessarily the level of, uh, 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 what I want to say, a reflection of my obedience. Here's another story a, a friend told me. She said she was fixing lunch for people who were coming over and she was making tuna sandwiches and as far as she was concerned, she had plenty for the number of people coming. And the Lord said to her, go to the store and buy some more tuna. She said, I got plenty here, you know. And the Lord said, go to the store and buy more tuna. So she said, I got in my car and I started driving out to the store. And on my way, I came upon an auto accident that just happened. And the woman was trapped in the car with her dog. And so she said, I stopped, I ran there, and I pulled her out of the car. And I got the dog out, pulled him to the side of the road, and called 911. So did the Lord send her to go rescue? What if the Lord says, there's going to be an accident down the road, and I want you to go there and be there for the woman who's, trapped, who's going to be trapped in her car? No. He said, go to the store and buy some tuna. Well, the long story, she never did get it because she was being sent to rescue that woman in the accident. So the result was, I didn't come home with tuna. So do you say, well, you know, that the measure, the measure of my my obedience was because I, I failed because I didn't come up with more tuna? No. So whatever the Lord tells you to do and what He sends you to do, He has 
He has a purpose. The Lord may tell you, oh, this is another, and this is another story. I'll just share it with you because these are really good. Uh, one of the people that I was praying with was telling me the story that <clears throat> she was looking forward to, her, to a bit family vacation. They were going to go, you know, out of California. And she wanted to spend the weekend with her brother and had made all these plans, looking forward to it. And one day, her sister-in-law, whom she's not really fond of, texted her and said, I want to tell you that I love you, and we all, the whole family loves you, just want to let you know. And so she said, well, I read the text, and I thought, oh, whatever. The very next day, she got a call from her brother that says, we are not going to be able to join you for that weekend. And she was, at first she said, she was just so crushed because she was looking forward to this weekend with her brother. But then she was reminded that sister-in-law, who she didn't give much credence to, said, we love you. So the Lord was assuring her and telling her that he was there. And how she felt about family and, and friends made a big difference to him. So, maybe you were the one that the Lord said, you know, text so-and-so, he said, ah, or give so-and-so a call and tell them this. And you just, just ask them how they are. And you think, why am I, I haven't talked to them for months. Why am I going, well, just do it. Just do it. <laughs> Be obedient. All right, so I'm trying to give you examples how you're the results you think you're going to get may not be the results that God wants. You may make that telephone call to be friendly, and they're angry at you, they blow you off and hang up on you. You know what? You are obedient. That's all that counts, because you don't know what's going on on the other side of the telephone. God's using you to interject something that you have no clue what it's about. So, obedience. Got it? All right. Let's see what time it is. You still with me? Yeah. Can, you, can you go on for more? Look at your page two. Oh, so I didn't put that on. All right, number one. Capture the vision. I told you about the three mindsets. The barbarian, the Greek, and the Hebrew. And obedience is number one. Now, we must know the difference between reform and change. When you reform something, you look at the past. And you want to change it from what was in the past, and you want to make it better. I'm not saying there's something wrong with that. I'm just trying to give you the difference between reform and transform. So reform is... You build something that's on the past. But transform is you look to the future. You look to the future. For instance, reform uh, in, a, in a factory, you can reform the way they make cars. So you have the, the people working, okay, so you're going to give them better tools and you're going to use better parts and uh, you don't manufacture all the parts, someplace else manufactures the parts and they ship it to you and all that. But how you manufacture cars are transformed when all these robots come in, where everything is done by robots, computerized. So now you're not relying on the human error part. You're doing it by robots. So the manufacture of cars have been transformed. The way we communicate with text and email, that has been transformed. If it's reformed, then we have to build a better post office system, because that's how we used to do it. You see what I mean? It, it, people look to the future. So, if you want to be transformed, you have to be looking toward the future. You think out of the box. So, that's where you want to go. When, when we say, 
God wants to transform us. We've got to think out of the box. He wants to take us out of the box. All right, so let's look at Jesus. Jesus, who was he, and what was his character, and what works did he do? I'm going to segment your thinking. Who, character, and what you do. Because what you do isn't necessarily who you are. And your character isn't all what you do. So look at the first column. Who is Jesus? Jesus is a, a healer. He's a Lord of nature. He's a deliverer. He's a judge. He's a savior and a provider. Anybody disagree with that? No. All right. So move right. The character trait. As a healer, he showed compassion. And so that's his character trait. And on the right, move over right one more. And what was the evidence that we can see that was? He healed people. Lord of nature. What is his character trait? He's powerful. What did he do? He calmed the seeds. See how that's working? Deliverer. He's authoritative. Cast out demons. He's a judge. He was just. He forgave the woman in adultery. It's a savior, merciful. He forgave the thief. He's a provider. He was generous, and he fed the 5,000, and he turned water into wine. Now, because the character traits in Jesus is there all the time, and who he is is there all the time, the evidence might change, but that he's still who he is. For instance, he's a deliverer. He would be mercy, he could be a merciful deliverer, and he can cast out demons, or he can heal people as a deliverer, deliver them from their sicknesses. Pick another one. He's a provider. As a provider, he has compassion. So you can jump up, you can pick any one of those traits. He has compassion. And out of compassion, he fed the 5,000, or he calmed the seas. Do you see how that, see what I'm trying to show you? The character traits stay. That means they're within him all the time. Who he is, stay. And the evidence, now, those are the ones, just the ones I gave you, but you can think of other evidence that I didn't give you, evidence of these things. He delivered the, the what I want to say, the, the boy that the, fa the father brought the boy who was flailing in the, with the demons, took care of that. He had compassion on that on that person. So, what character trait of Christ do you want? Okay, back back up. Go back to the chart. Give me another who Jesus is. From from your memory from of the Bible. Who Pure. Jesus is? <coughs> Purity. Uh, purity. Is that a character trait or who he is? <laughs> who is Jesus? His father. Okay, father. All right. So under who is Jesus? The father. And what would be the character trait of a father? God the father. I'm thinking like loving and present. Because you know how there's a scripture that says how you know, he's a father to the fatherless, you know, for the, you know. Okay. So what's the character trait? So what's the character trait? I would think like protective. Okay. Protective? Protective. Um, All right, we can use that. He's protective. Um, what would be evidence that he was a father? Um, 
I didn't get that. Um, when he's like calming the seas and stuff, he's, he's being a protector. He's, yeah. Okay, he's protecting them when he calm the seas. How about um, he, I would I would say he was like a father to Jairus's daughter. You see? Raising her from the dead, that's a pretty good fatherly thing to do. <laughs> what about a power That would be on yeah. It would work. That's that's you're getting it. That's what I mean. No kids, we have to be authoritative. So he would be a father and he'd be authoritative. That's a character trait. That's right. Right? So all the character traits stay there. He would provide for needs, whatever it might be. Okay, as a provider. That's right. Well, that's actually evidence, too, though. Mm hmm. But, you know, all the things that we say, okay, we say, oh Lord, you are my shepherd. You're the beginning and the end. You're the beginning and the end. All of these names of Jesus. That's who he is. And who his, what his character is. He leads us and he guides us. He leads us and he guides us. He leads us and he guides us. Okay? Counselor. Counselor? Counselor is another one of what he is. So let's jump to number five. What character trait of Christ do you want? And what will be the evidence that you have become that? Spread the good news. Okay, let's get something really specific. I mean, not that that isn't good. So for instance, pick a character trait that you would like. Pick one. What? Merciful. Merciful. All right. So you see where it says character trait? So write merciful in there. Now, what would be the evidence that you are merciful? It could be if someone close to you has done something that you don't like. You'd be merciful if you don't read them out and yell and scream and call them names. Right? Yeah. Forgive. You would forgive. Do you see how that works? Okay, each of you choose one where it says character trait. What character trait do you want? Write two of them in there. Okay, don't worry about how you're going to have evidence. First, what character trait do you want? Okay, write it in there for you. Compassion. So you should have chosen two character traits that you want. Oh. Everybody did that? Mm -hmm. The block two and three. So then you move right. What would be evidence that you have that character trait? You don't have to walk on water. <laughs> so, compassion. Did somebody choose compassion? Yeah. All right. So what would be compassion? What, would, what are compassionate things that you could do? Forgive. What's that? Forgive. Oh, no, you got to be more specific. Oh. I'm trying to get you guys down to the where the rubber meets the road. Oh, well, that's good. I want something more. even more specific. Um, for me, I was thinking, um, I struggle with alcoholism, and so um, a character trait of compassion would be um, working with people that are newcomers into the program, people that are just getting, you know, just learning about the disease and stuff. Okay, that's good. You folks are still going global. 
I want you to come down to where the rubber meets the road. So like taking your picture that will uh, meeting your friend in the hospital and praying. Okay, visiting a friend in the hospital. How about just writing a note to someone you know that's having a hard time? Maybe they're going through a divorce, they just lost a parent. You could write a note, you could telephone them, you could call them. Just calling to see how you're doing. Contact people. Make a contact, a personal contact, where you're showing compassion. You could feel their pain. Okay, but we don't always. I'm not. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying I'm trying to get you folks. I understand that. Okay, sometimes we don't understand. <clears throat> sometimes we don't feel the pain. But you can be compassionate. We, we can be compassionate because you see we're choosing to be compassionate. I'm not going to let my emotions dictate whether I'm compassionate. I'm choosing to. Be I'm trying to get you folks to step up into the area of the will to choose to be obedient. So you have to take action. I would love for you to give an example. So the authoritative one, if you want to have power, you know, in your life, you know, you know, for God to use out there with others, what are some of those ways? Because I'm, I'm thinking in my mindset of, you know, my faith and, and like their salvation. Okay, so what's the trait that you did you choose? Authority. Oh, authority. Yes. Authority. Okay, so what can you do to be authoritative in your area, where the rubber meets the road? Anybody have any ideas? Okay, I mean, this is, I know I wrote that down because mm -hmm. I want to be able to pray for people and they get healed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, to have the power and the authority. Okay, number one, you got to pray for people. Number two, you have to pray by obedience. Because they may not get healed. But did you pray by obedience? You cannot use, yeah, I too would like to see them get healed. <clears throat> That's why it's important that you pray by obedience. And then that way you release the Lord how, to do His work. How do you mean by, I'm not sure how you, what do you mean, pray by obedience? Because the Lord told me to. Oh, isn't it, because, oh, wait, isn't it always appropriate to pray for others? No? No? No. Okay. No. Generally speaking, like it's always nice to shake hands and greet people. <laughs> well. All right. But it's not always appropriate to just jump on somebody and say, I've got to pray for you. So it means because, because here's what happens, you know. Let's just say, Becca comes here and I can see that she's, she's sick. Or I just heard the story about well, she's suffering from some kind of ailment. Mm -hmm. But boy, she is leery about people getting near her and touching her or doing any hocus pocus. I got an answer for that. So I need, to be, I need to hear the Lord whether he... He wants me to pray for her. Otherwise, I'm going to scare her out of the park. So rather than, you know, that's the religious spirit that says, oh, you got to pray for her. So I could, you know, because I could go up to her and say, oh, you know, I'm going to pray well, for you. I don't mean necessarily hands-on, but just to pray for someone. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm talking about interacting with ah, people. Okay. okay, yeah, you can pray as much as you want in your prayer closet. Oh, okay. <laughs> But how do you know um, you just, the Lord telling, like you said, you want to be obedient, right? Mm -hmm. And how do you know God's directing you versus the religious spirit? Good question. <laughs> Good question. Stay to the end of the day. And you're right. <laughs> That's what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to teach you. God talks to you. He tells you. It's not just a coincidence, but you know that he arranges. You can see that person. And when you see that person, he speaks to you, you know, right away that God 
Or I see the crazy. Right, it's a convergence. You got to be spontaneous of, when it talks to you. Um, and let me ask you a question too about praying for people when you're not with them. Um, yeah, I'm talking about okay. Clock. That's that's important. That's important to ask the Lord too, because if he if they're not your assignment, and you're praying and praying and praying, you're going to just wear yourself out. Mm -hmm. So what you need to do is you need to spend your energy on praying your assignment. So sometimes sometimes people ask me to pray for them, and yes, I'll pray for them because they ask and I say yes. But I don't hang on to it and keep going, keep no. going until I see a result. Unless the Lord told me, unless He told me, keep going until this happens. Sure. But otherwise, I'm just spinning my wheels. So I want to spend all my energy on the ones that's assigned to me. Assigned, sure. yeah, right? I'm sure. Right. Assigned to you, right? Right. You have to do obedience. Do your assignment. Do your homework. Don't do somebody else's homework. Do your homework first. Uh -huh. And how do you know that uh, someone is assigned? <laughs> Same thing I asked. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you in a couple hours. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any any other? Oh, this is good. Because we're all going to be transformed. All going to be transformed. Turn to the next page. It's all about me. We've heard that in a bad way. Well, we think it's all about me. But let me tell you, it is all about you. Everything in the Bible is what God has done for me and you. He said Jesus for who? For me. All the promises in the Bible are for? They're for me. And all the trouble he went through down through the ages was for me. So it is all about me. And we have to we have to understand that in the right light, in the right way. This is not the selfish kind of thing. It's coming to gratitude. It's coming to understand that God is doing all of this for me. So why push it away? Why run from it? It's for me. If somebody brought a birthday cake because it was your birthday, you're not going to say, oh, well, you know, it's not for me. That no, is for you. It's your birthday, and the birthday cake's for you. So learn how to accept it. So God did all these things. All right, God, look, look at the first column, who God says I am. God says that I am beloved. So I want you all to say, I am beloved. I am beloved. I am a new creature. I am a servant. I am a friend of God. I am chosen of God. I am adopted of God. I am redeemed. I am a living stone. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. I am of the royal priesthood. I am of the royal priesthood. And I am an heir with Christ. I am an heir with Christ. You are, because God says you are. If you don't agree with any of that, then you are not in agreement with the Word of God, because that's what the Word of God says you are. Remember this thing, coming into alignment with His Word? So, if you have not believed that you are a living stone, then you need to repent. <laughs> I repent of not believing I'm a living, living stone. I repent of not believing that I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. You said I am, so I'm agreeing with you. I am. Now, maybe I'm not in my exact condition yet, but I am. I am. All right, go move right. Character traits. All right, I am kind. Say that. I am kind. I, I am courage. I am faithful. I am faithful. I am merciful. I am merciful. I am patient. I am patient. I am forgiving. I am forgiving. I am joyful. I am joyful. I am enthusiastic. I am enthusiastic. I am strong. I am strong. I am compassionate. I am compassionate. 
compassion. I am bold. I am bold. I am powerful. I am powerful. I am authoritative. I am generous. I am generous. So you see, you the col the far column on the left and the column in the middle go together. I am a servant who is faithful. See how that works? Mm -hmm. If I am adopted of God, then I am forgiving because God is forgiving. If I am adopted of God, then I'm joyful. See how that works? So you, you have all of those traits because God says you are all these people. Now go far to the far right. And that is what you do. So, take it from the top. I am, I am beloved of God. I am beloved of God. I am kind. I am kind. And I practice medicine. And I practice medicine. So that's what Augusto would say. But you can also say, I am beloved of God, I am kind, and I do mothering. Because that's what you do. Am I making sense? Yes. Alright, so it's who God says you are, and what character traits he has put in you, and the other one is what you do. So look at the what you do column. So these are all things that could be occupations or just things that you do. You can practice medicine, you can practice law, you can be a teacher, you do mothering, you do fathering, you can do computer programming, play baseball, dance, sing, plan events, do homeschooling, hairdressing, do therapy, and any number of things, number of things. Now what happens is, often, we limit ourselves by what we do. No. You have to go to the other side, go to the left, of who God says you are, mm. and the character traits that he has put in you. So don't say, I am not compassionate. You are compassionate. He's put it in you. The only thing you have to do is open the package and use it. Don't say, I am not bold. Oh, I'm not bold. How can that parent? No, you are bold, because God put it in you. You just haven't opened the package yet. And you haven't read the directions on how to use it. Authoritative. He put, he has, that's waiting for you. That's another package waiting for you. Or maybe you open the package, and now you're reading the directions, trying to figure out how to use it properly. Am I tweaking your thinking? Yes? Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> because God doesn't want us to be limited by the work of our hands. Because I, you know, you can do all, you can, you can practice law and teach and be a mother. You can play baseball, dance and sing all, all, of, all in your whole lifetime. And even more. So don't be limited by what you do and your character traits. All right. I am, I'm going to go to the bottom. I am, not whoever God says I am, who is, and a character trait, who does. So write this sentence for yourself, and you get to choose. On the right, right in the blank. I am, so choose the one that you want. Am I, am I clear? Mm -hmm. All right. Who is, and put in your character trait, choose one. Who, and then tell me what you do. So I'll give you an example. So I can say, I have chosen of God, who is enthusiastic, and I plan events. So I am who God says I am. I have the trait that God has put in me, and this is what I do. So write, take care of room for three. Write three things. Choose three things.
Anybody have any trouble? Do you know? Yeah. Okay. okay. Choose one from the first column that you would like to be, or you know who you are, because I told you you are. The Bible told you you are. New creation. Okay. I am a new creation. Who is? Now choose one of the traits. Is joyful and I, what do you do? What do I do for a living? Doesn't matter. You cook, you clean, you drive a car, you drive, I don't know. What do you do? I do a lot of things. Well, choose one. Choose something you want to do as well as something that you already do. Yeah, choose something you already do right now. For right now. For now. Alright. Choose anything, Debbie. You do laundry, you cook, you well, you work? I drive. You drive? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So your doing should be connected to your character trait. Like she said, when she's most joyful, she's driving? No. That's no. where she least says, joyful. least joyful when she's driving. So, see, I'm trying to get her thinking change. I'm a new creature who is joyful when I'm driving. So as, as you keep telling yourself that and, and changing your thinking, then when you're driving, you go, oh, I'm supposed to be joyful. Okay, I'm going to be joyful. I choose to be joyful because that I choose to open that package of character trait that's in me. I'm trying to get you to open your presence. Could you also use that, like, I am a new creation who is joyful and I am a wife? No, that's too general. Wives do too many things. <laughs> I am a mother, you do, and I do mothering. Yeah. Okay. Do another one. To, to me, I don't get though. Like, what's the difference between I do mothering versus I do things as a wife? You know, because I do a lot of different things as a mother, and I do a lot of different things as a wife. Uh, the difference is relationship. You'll know. Three o'clock, you know. <laughs> okay. Okay, then that question right here someplace. Oh, no, I just, for me, I put, um, I thought that I, since um, I lost a loved one, I'm of new creation now, and um, my character trait is encouraging and what I do is I practice understanding of pain and sorrow towards others. Okay. I really, you know, when somebody else loses somebody, mm -hmm. um, I've allowed my husband's death to make me a better person versus a better person, which then leads me to uh, helping others through their pain and sorrow. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Somebody else has something you want to share? Do you have something? What did you choose? Well, all the columns is good, but not really. Um, just only one uh, applied to me right now. That is, um, um, I like creation, a new creation. Um, and I um, want to uh, do modeling. Okay. To, uh, but you got to get the trait in there first. See, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get your thinking into who God says you are and what are the traits that's a package in you. And the last thing is what you do because what you do is going to change. But who you are in Christ is not going to change. 
And the characteristic that you hold in Christ is not going to change. What you do changes. Under character traits, and I think this is where I get confused sometimes, um, can obedience be under that? Or is that just, is obedience just an action, it's not a character trait? No, obedience would be a character trait. The list I gave you is just a, a list. Yeah. It's not an exhaustive list that there is in any other. So, well, yes. Well, maybe like obedient is a character trait, obedience. Yes. Yes. Obedience yes. is an action, obedient is a yeah, character trait. Obedient. I am a new creation who is joyful and authoritative uh, who teaches painting. Yes, that's right. Because you didn't always teach painting. You did painting, but didn't always, right? Not always, but for quite right. a long while. Right, right. <laughs> for, for a long time, right, right. And interestingly enough, that is the one area that I actually do feel really joyful about. Okay, okay, good, good. Anybody else? I pray for three things every morning. <laughs> to be obedient, to be patient, and very difficult to be humble. Okay. Yeah. All right. But who does, which one did you choose that God says who you are? Which one? First column. Uh, obedient. No, no, that's a, that's a character column. trait. First column. Uh, a servant. A servant. You mean the first column, right? A servant. Oh, a servant. Yeah, he's got a New York accent. You gotta deal with that. <laughs> okay, so you're a servant who is a servant who is who is obedient and patient and humble. Okay, and you do what's the action that you do? I, well, I teach. You sell insurance. You what? I don't I'm know. A teacher. <laughs> who teaches? Right. Mm -hmm. I'm going to retire to okay. New York City school okay. teacher. Okay. Now, make sure, and this is this is what I'm getting from. Make sure you hit that first column because that's what's going to establish you. That first column, because the first column is what puts you in line with his word. See, what happens is the world gets you from the third column. You say, oh, you know, oh, she's a teacher, so she, so she must be kind, and therefore, no, 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 because not all teachers are kind. Whiplash. <laughs> 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 <Good class. laughs> yeah. So, so that's the, the world will get you from the third column, and then assume the second column, and then the, the first column kind of falls away. So you want to hit the, you want to go from the first column. God says that I am a new creature, a servant, uh, whatever I, want, I have there. A friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. What does that mean? Because I'm a friend of God, then I have this characteristic, and it just happens that I sell insurance. Are you, are you getting it? This is really important. It tweaks our thinking because we're so used to thinking the other way around. Okay. okay, so like one could be, I mean, I am a friend of God who is bold and witnesses. Okay. And what about I am a new creation who is compassionate, who do occupation. Occupation, what is occupation? This means your job, right? My job. Okay. Right. What do you have, Cecilia? Is authoritative and does commercial real estate. Um, everybody wants to be a new creature, right? You don't like the old creature? <laughs> Nobody wants to be a friend of God? <laughs> okay, we'll take one more. Uh, I have a different 
because like you said, how the world looks at what you do. And so one of my jobs is bartending. Okay. And so, you know, customers, you know, I talk to customers and, and I would, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I'm like, when I talk to them, I tell them, I'm like, it's not who I am. It's what I do. Because I know that, you know, I'm a child of God and, you know, a friend of God and these things. And it's just something I'm doing to make money. Right. And my identity is not wrapped up in that. Right. So let's, let's take that, let's just take those facts. And which one would you be here? The, um, one of the things I put down was um, I'm a friend of God um, who is generous and who lends out money. Well, <laughs> I'm a friend of God who is generous. Generous. And what I do, I lent out money to friends. Lend out money? Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. So I'm not. Okay. Yeah. I was gonna. I was gonna take what you said. Like, anything. Yeah. Sure. So I'm a child of God who. I'm um, chosen of God who is compassionate. I'm compassionate. And I do bartending. Yeah. I serve drinks to people. Okay, but you're compassionate because you listen to their stories, right? Okay. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else? You got one? I'm just. I said I'm chosen of God and I'm generous and I give to charity. Okay. Any other question? Are you kind of sort of with me? I'm trying to tweak your thinking to go from God into the world, not from, from the world into God. Go that way. All right. Let's, uh, let's take a break.